Welcome back, guys. Again, this is Dr. Severin. In this lecture, we're going to talk about chest examinations. So we've covered spirometry. We've covered how to assess lung volumes and perfusion. In this series of videos, we'll go over kind of what we do in the clinic, our clinical examinations um, of patients with different uh, respiratory conditions or symptoms. So the examinations or chest examinations um, or when we start examining the pulmonary systems, there's several different components we can assess. We can look at respiratory muscle performance. We'll cover that in a later lecture. That ties, it's more a little bit more relevant um, when we're looking at patients going into pulmonary rehab, for, for example. Chest wall mobility, um, we'll get into that. Respiration, ventilation. We'll cover some lung segment auscultation, what's normal, what's abnormal. Um, and you know, even as our visual observation, we can glean so much information from just looking at how our patients are presenting just you know, from an observational standpoint. Cough function, critically important, and we'll get more into that in our airway clearance lecture. Quality of life and subjective reports, we'll go over some of that. Um, exercise capacity, we've covered that quite extensively already, but that's going to be something that's going to be affected in many patients with respiratory conditions or symptoms. Uh, balance, and we'll cover why balance might be assessed or might be assessed and might be impaired in certain patients. Uh, mobility and strength. Like I, I mentioned these here because I think often we, we forget that you know these are core components of a of a of a PT chest examination, right? Or in any any type of profession that you know if we're looking for, but especially for PT, if we're looking for you know, how they operate within their the environment, we still need to assess some of those foundational components of human performance, strength, mobility, balance, stuff like that. Um, and, and for pulmonary patients especially, you know, make sure you ask about, you know, flare-ups, activity status, um, you know, what's their weight? We know that in certain populations, especially COPD and IPF, like losing body weight can be a big, big, big uh, concern. So again, um, from visual observation, we're looking at their disposition, right? Are they in distress? Are they short of breath? Um, are they somnolent? We remember we talked about patients with sleep apnea, they can have this kind of hazy, daisy kind of, uh, you know, approach. Um, or just or disposition rather, um, it's hazy daisy disposition. Their skin, um, you know, do they have edema? Right? Is there JVD? Are they cyanotic? Are they sweating? Like, what is there something that we can just we can see from just a you know visual inspection? You know, is there something just wrong? Something that's just just not normal, right? What's their body position and posture? I don't get too hung up on this. Um, again, we talked about how even in very severe deficits, um, you know, this doesn't often affect respiration. It may affect exercise capacity to a degree in certain patients, but you know, um, in terms of longstanding things with posture, there's not much we're going to do, um, you know, from a PT unless we're going to be bracing a patient. But it's always good to see, like, you know, are they barrel chested, right? Maybe you know that could indicate they've got COPD. What's you know, what's their? Uh, are they slouched and guarding? Remember, we talked about how rib fractures. Um, have um, you know a certain uh, you know they'll be hunched over splinting to protect that side. You know is there a significant pes oscavatum or pes cardionum? We'll go over what that means in a bit. And what's their breathing pattern? Again, I don't get too hung up on looking at breathing patterns because I you know think you can get a little bit too in, deep in the weeds on this. But yeah, you want to get a general assessment like what's their rate and depth? Like are they breathing really fast? Are they breathing really shallow? Right? Are they breathing um, or are they breathing relaxed? And calm, right? Are they using excessive accessory muscles? Remember, I don't really like that term because those quote unquote accessory muscles, your scalene, sort of quite a mass, they are always active. They assist, they're an accessory to the diaphragm, which is the primary you know, component, right, to inspiration. But if we didn't have our upper chest wall muscles activating, we wouldn't have upper rib cage expansion during normal breathing. It wouldn't happen, and that's supposed to happen, right? Um, is uh, there an asymmetrical or paradoxical chest wall movement? And we're talking about like significant differences. And I'll show you what that actually means. And I think, again, people get often into the weeds on what this is while forgetting there's normal variances. And we're actually finding there may be sex-based differences. And, um, you know, women may, may normally use more lower rib cage movement. Men may use more upper rib cage movement, uh, especially during exercise. So there may just be normal variances, right? And again, remember we mentioned Breathing, you know, patterns are a little bit variable, um, even inherently. That's actually not a bad thing if we really want to break it down to minutia. They're always a little bit different. So just be, be mindful of that. 
Um, do we see nasal flaring, right? Nasal flaring is an indicator maybe people aren't getting adequate uh, ventilation and they gotta you know, really open up those airways to breathe in. Um, are they using oxygen? That's an easy kind of dead giveaway. If someone walks into your clinic and they're on supplemental oxygen and they're using like a heavy duty mask to, del to deliver it or a pressurized mask, um, yeah, that's, or a non-rebreather, yeah, that, that, that probably means they're not breathing super well, right? Maybe there's something going on there that we might want to be a little bit more mindful of or inspect, right? Um, if you're in a hospital, they might be already hooked up to a pulse oximeter. Like, you might be able to see, like, are they hovering around 90? Like, what's going on here? So, again, there's a lot we can do from assessing the respiratory system by just looking at the patient and looking in just what's around them. Like, are they on oxygen, right? Um, you know, is there a pulse oximeter hooked up to them? Are they slouched over? Are they hyperventilating, right? What's what's going on here? Or are they telling you that I'm short of breath or I can't breathe? Like, you know, stuff like that. You can get a lot just from looking at your patients. And again, here's an example of what true paradoxical uh, chest woman. This is someone who has a real norm, abnormal breathing pattern. So for my colleagues in Brazil, and as you can see, when this patient breathes in, their chest wall um, rises, but their abdomen sucks in. That's not a normal pattern, right? So this patient had very, very severe COPD, um, and just an example of kind of what we would see uh, there. And we'll continue again. And in uh, terms of abnormal posture, so again, we can just you know get a pretty good assessment of maybe something's going on here. You're looking at flared nostrils, it's especially relevant in kids. You might be able to see this in a neonate, like are their na nares really, really open? Um, again, trying to just draw in more ventilation because maybe they're, they're not getting you know, adequate. They gotta really open up those airways to, to bring something in. Um, and again, our classic picture from Netter, like we, we use these images in medical education um, just to kind of burn these patterns um, a recognition of what we would see in, in these patients and just remembering like a patient with COPD, you know, hunched over often, maybe a little bit, um, especially uh, emphysmatic COPD, hunched over, you know, using excessive accessory muscle uses, uh, muscle usage, they're pursing their lips, right? Again, the slow down respiration to get more volume out. Um, you know, and then we might even see, again, just really, really, really um, atrophied. And again, you know, abnormal postures, like what, you know, are there really significant changes to the rib cage, right? Do we see a scoliosis, which is you know, rotation in the thoracic spine? Um, you know, do we see that, you know, pes, you know, uh, escavatum or pes carniatum where we've got, you know, uh, we, you know the ex an extension, right, of the, of the rib cage or a protrusion of the rib cage? Um, these are all things that we can, you know, glean just from looking at our patients. And then getting into ventilation, right? So looking at, you know, breathing rate and how much they're doing, right? So um, normal valves to respiratory rate, again, we cover this in our basic vitals assessment, but adults gonna be between 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Um, and that's not, should be greater than 20. Greater than 20 is tachypnea. Um, and then bradypnea, which would be less than 12. So 12 to 20 is normal. If you're above 20, that would be faster breathing than normal analogous to tachycardia, tach tachypnea, fat, you know, greater than 20. And then bradypnea would be uh, less than 12, okay? Um, infants typically have higher bre uh, breathing rates. Um, this has to do with um, how the rib cage in children tends to be a little bit more vertical or sorry, horizontally oriented. Normally in adults, as your ribs and your chest wall develops, it become more angled. So you're able to develop a little bit more torque and movement. Um, so that doesn't happen with kids. They don't have as much displacement to expand the chest. Um, so they've got to move a little bit more rate. So they have a little bit less volume. They need a little bit more rate. And their lungs are just smaller because they're smaller people. <laughs> um, so as they age, as you move from infancy to adolescence, you know, your rib cage normalizes, your lungs normal, you know, or age and develop, um, and you're able to draw in bigger volumes, you don't have to breathe as fast. Um, so again, just you know, appreciating that kids will have you know, a little bit faster of a, of a respiratory rate, and that's, that's in the normal thing. And if you've ever held a little baby, like you'll, you'll appreciate they're, they're breathing a little bit faster. It's kind of, kind of adorable, actually. So, and then ways to assess it, we cover this again, you can either just visualize, just use discretion, like you don't wanna be just staring at someone's chest. Um, the problem with telling someone you're looking at their breathing rate 
Um, we have the Hawthorne effect when, we're, when we know someone's looking at us, we kind of change our behaviors. Um, and we want to get a more, you know, what their breathing rate is typically. So what I often do is I tell patients that I'm going to be calculating their heart rate for a minute. And I can get by with calculating heart rate or pulse rate, which is a technical term for measuring at, the, at a pulse, um, for 60 seconds. But I only measure pulse rate for 30 seconds. And the remaining 30, while I'm still, you know, showing them or making them think I'm measuring pulse rate, I'm actually measuring the respiratory rate. Um, so I can look at their shoulder, um, or I can ask, hey, can I place my hand on your shoulder? Again, use discretion. You know, your, the chest and upper shoulder area can be a little bit of a sensitive area for people, so always just ask. Um, but, you know, you can kind of get by with it, you know, you know doing this, and they'll, they'll never really know you're assessing. Again, because, again, breathing is a state-dependent sort of thing, and if they, people know they're being watched, their breathing patterns are going to be a little bit different. So uh, just be mindful of that. Now, respiration, again, um, which is talking about the diffusion of gases, they're related to the ventilation, all in their concept of, of breathing, but they're different, right? Ventilation is moving air in and out of the lungs. Respiration is how well we diffuse gases, and we, we do a pretty good job at, at both, typically. Our ways to assess it, uh, we've got a few. Um, you'll learn about arterial blood so you'll, you'll learn about arterial blood gases in a, in a little bit, um, but the easy handheld way to do this, uh, to assess this, would be pulse oximetry. So pulse oximetry um, is a way for us to indirectly assess the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin and arterial blood, remembering that at normal high concentrations, right, for, uh, for you know, above that 70 you know, millimeters of mercury or within that range of 70 to 100, right, hemoglobin's for the most part going to be, you know, or oxygen's for the most part going to be bound to hemoglobin. When we start dipping below that, then we start get we have problems. So we can make an indirect inference of what um, arterial blood um, oxygen concentration is by looking how well, how well bound oxygen or how saturated hemoglobin is with oxygen. So um, in a normal, healthy individual breathing at sea level, um, which, you know, changing altitude is the, or oxygen tension or the concentration in the, in the air is the only really way to, you know, affect this without having disease. Um, you know, it's going to be between 95 to 100% um, with a plus or minus uh, 2%, especially when at really low um, states of, of perfusion. But always, re always remember there's, there's a little bit of the degree of air with these measurements. And there are some things that can affect pulse oximetry accuracy. You know, all this measure does is basically shine a little light um, through the fingernails or through the skin that reflects off uh, hemoglobin cells and the reflection of that um, beam or the way it passes through and re is recorded uh, gives us, you know, a reflection of, you know, how well or how, how much hemoglobin or oxygen is, hem oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. So we can tell by the reflection of light from those little blood cells um, how well, um, you know, oxygen is bound to hemoglobin or how saturated hemoglobin is with oxygen. Now, anything obviously that will impair the ability for that light to pass through um, will impair the ability or the accuracy of that measurement. So if someone's got really thick nails or really dark skin, um, or if they just have really low perfusion, like there's just not a lot of blood passing through those limbs, uh, might not work super well. Um, if they have really, really low um, you know, oxygen concentrations in blood, like that's not, that's going to affect pulse oximetry. Are they, if they're moving a lot, right? That's, an, that's a, again, a big problem, I think, in uh, acute care practice, um, or even just, you know, any, any, even outpatient practice, we, we often throw on our pulse oximeters when patients are moving, um, while forgetting that, you know, if it's on their hands, on their fingers, and they're walking, with the reciprocal arm movements that occur with walking, it's gonna th it's gonna create some motion artifact. Now, typically on a, on a monitor, you'll get a little like tracing that should have a sinusoidal wave pattern, and we'll show what that looks like in our ICU lecture. But if that's not there, like that's that means that measurement's not probably not accurate. Um, there are ways around it. They've got ear clips, they've got headbands you can put on that aren't as affected. So just consider that. Um, as well as anytime someone has you know a lot of light shining on that, that's gonna affect how well that. Um, signals propagated. So again, pulse oximetry, indirect way for us to look at how, you know, well someone is diffusing gases. Okay. Another assessment we can look at is sputum production. So we talked about some, a few different types of sputum. So uh, bloody sputum or hemoptysis, coughing up blood, again, hallmark sign of pulmonary embolism. Blood streak sputum, we see that often with patients with like very severe, you know, very severe coughing bouts. We start having little, you know, traumas to the airways or barotrauma, which causes like blood to kind of get in the sputum. 
Uh, frothy pink sputum, again, that's with when we have the alveoli and respiratory bronchioles filled with fluid, like we see in ARDS or a pulmonary edema, right, which is a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of swelling, and that mixes, you know, and that creates these air bubbles in that fluid. And if we expectorate or cough it out, we get this pink frothy sputum. That's a hallmark sign of pulmonary edema, which is not a good sign. Then we've got purulent sputum, right? So anytime we've got like a really bad um, infection, um, it could change colors. So it'll be yellow, green, or maybe even really gr like dirty gray. Um, small amounts you can see maybe with someone with that acute bronchitis, which again, just you know, the airways are irritated as mast cells are triggered, um, or you know, someone who had a pneumonia that's resolving. Uh, if it's really copious, when we talk about you know really, really kind of um, gnarly uh, bacterial infections, we'll have that you know, productive, highly productive, um, you know, mucus production. If it's really foul smelling, you know, that can indicate, you know, some sort of anaerobic infection, which creates these kind of foul smelling gases, um, or a, a really bad lung, uh, lung abscess. Um, if someone's got really stringy mucoid, I don't know if you guys remember the movie Big Daddy with uh, Adam Sandler and the kid spits and like spits down and drips all the way down and touches the ground, he sucks it back up. Um, uh, that's kind of like what I'm talking about here. So if anyone who's had an asthma attack, you know, can probably attest to that. You've got these, uh, you know, these, you know, this really kind of stringy, uh, almost proteaceous uh, mucus. Now, another thing we can use to assess uh, dyspnea is a, or, or, uh, or another assessment we can make from patients that is very, very simple. It's just ask them how short of breath they are and get some quantifiable data. So there are scales uh, that we can utilize. MRC dyspnea scale or a modified medical research council's dyspnea scale is probably the easiest one. Um, it's a zero to four scale, so a five point scale. And that's asks the patient um, how short of breath they are and some qualifiers for what causes them to get short of breath. So zero is they only get short of breath when they're really pushing it, right? Which is normal, right? Um, however, there are some patients and I've worked with some that they get you know so short of breath they can't leave their house or they get short of breath like just putting on clothes, right? Like they had such a limited respiratory capacity or their respiratory system so impaired, even the basic ADLs are taxing to them, right? They can't leave their house. Um, the, the dyspnea scale is great. It's super easy um, to assess. Again, it's a single question. Um, it's significantly related to health uh, related quality of life. Um, and you may see changes in this scale before we see changes in um, gold classification or FEV1s um, in patients with COPD. So that's very, very useful. Um, I use it for uh, my bariatric population, um, you know, which is not a quote unquote pulmonary condition, but they often report dyspnea. So I find it very useful um, for those patients. Um, and I use it even as an outcome measure to track because it sometimes improves with exercise training, especially in an, an obese patient. Um, St. George Respiratory Questionnaire is another questionnaire that we can utilize to assess how breathing impacts quality of life. Um, it's a little bit more instrumented, but it's got a lot um, more data points. Um, so it can be very useful for tracking, you know, quantif um, or objectively or quantifiable data, how well someone's improving. Because maybe over a course of a, a pulmonary rehab program, you'll see this used quite often. So it's one of those, the, the industry standards um, for, for assessing uh, how dyspnea or respiratory impairments and impact quality of life and function. So um, very, very useful test. So with that, uh, we'll break here and then we'll get into some lung segment auscultation. Thank you.